everyone. Happy Thursday. What day is it? Who knows anymore? What is time, guys? Hi, Lena. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Molly. Hello, Deb. Nice to see all of you. Hello, Marie. Hi, Steph. How we doing? We make it through the week, okay? We're all all right? We gonna make it through January? We're almost there, people. A couple more days. Keep the head up high. Nice to see you all. Hello, Marie. Hello, Rachel. I see. Rachel, are you cooking along with us, it looks like? Love to see it. If you guys are cooking along with us, you're just hanging out in your office, want to check us out. We love to see you. Turn on the camera if you're comfortable. Love to see all the wonderful faces. Hello, hello, Zareen. Hello, everyone. Hello, Sue. Big news over here, everyone in Seattle. The sun is going to set after 5 p.m. today. So, like, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's we're in a party mode over here today. You caught us on a good day, guys. A big part, big party atmosphere here. How are you? How, throw in the chat. Hello from Dallas. Hello, th Finger Lakes. Ooh, hello from the Finger Lakes. Tell us where you're coming from, everyone. We love to hear it. We're here in the practically summer Seattle right now. Hello from Ithaca. Um, I'm Chef Jenny. I'm going to be your instructor today. We've got the wonderful, the fantastic, the legendary Chef George running the chat. He is uh, going to be answering all your questions. He's really the one in charge. So um, be nice to him. Ask him all the questions. If you've got a really important question, he'll flag us down. We, you're here for a good class today. We are making smothered steak, steak smothered in onions, alongside a fantastic potato and cauliflower mash. Mmm, sounds great. And best part is, our old friends, our wonderful friends from the American Diabetes Association are sponsoring this class. They're here with us. We're so lucky. We have the fantastic Viola here. Say hello to her, everyone. Say hello. She's the best. Also to Molly, too. Real heroes, the ones really keeping us on our toes, keeping us healthy, giving us all the great information. Um, what I love about these classes that we do with our friends at the ADA is that we are highlighting how it's so important, you know, to cook mindfully and healthy, but it doesn't have to be boring and it doesn't have to be bland. This recipe has so much flavor in it today. I, this is a real winner and it goes quick too. It's a quick recipe. So that's what I want. That's what's always so hard about when you're trying to cook a little more healthy is trying to think of new ideas, also trying to make sure it's healthy. So um, this recipe, we're so grateful to them. If you're thinking, I would love to know where there's more recipes, we got you, the di diabetesfoodhub.org. Let me say it one more time. Diabetesfoodhub.org. Chef um, George can throw that in the chat for you all. An amazing uh, recipe collection that they have. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, sides, salads, desserts, whatever you're looking for, they've got it. So even chefs, even myself, sometimes I'm just, you're trying to look for a new something new. So it's nice to have a good resource like that. Y'all, we got 4,500 people signed up for this class today. We got, it is a party. I guess you all heard the sun was setting after 5 p.m. here and you're like, yeah, let's party. So it is, we are so excited to see all of you. Um, new, new friends, welcome. This is gonna be about an hour class. Again, ask your questions in the chat. We'll throw information in the chat. If you really have one you wanna talk to me, throw the little hand up and um, Chef George will um, get my attention and we can talk to you live. We just ask that you take your camera off. To returning homemaders, welcome. Nice to see all of you. Gonna get jump right into it. Again, questions, ask Chef George. So, steak, steak smothered with onions and pota mashed potatoes. This feels almost like a holiday meal. This is like a special meal, guys. I'm having all the fills right now. Um, we're gonna start this dish by getting our potatoes going. I've got a pot here, show you, top down, bunch of water right there. As I'm going through my potatoes, you will notice here that I've got cold water. When making potatoes, one of the essential pieces of knowledge I can pass on to you today is do not start boiling your water and then you know peel or cut your potatoes and throw them in. 
Don't do that. The reason is, is because when you throw your potato in hot water, the outside's gonna start cooking right away, and it's gonna take time till you get to the center. So you're gonna uh, have uneven cooking, and then by the time all the potato is done, you're gonna have a good portion that's pretty mushy and grainy. Have you had those potatoes, the mushy potatoes? We've all gone to a holiday at a relative's house, right? And they were given the potato job, and they're like, oh, no, this is a disaster. And then, every yes, wow, that was a very triggering thing. I just, I just saw the heads go up and down. We've all had, you don't forget bad mashed potatoes. So cold water or room temperature water. It doesn't have to be ice cold. We just don't want hot or warm water, okay? So we've got these little guys. Look at these little fingerling potatoes. Adorable. I love these guys. Mostly, one, they're really flavorful, but they, because they're smaller, they cook faster. We get, we get, I like stuff that goes quick, guys. That makes life go around. We don't have time to spend 10 hours in the kitchen. We are going to slice these in little rounds. You see top down here. It's about, I'd say, an inch piece. That's what we're looking for. Look at that beautiful golden color on that. That's just beautiful. We're keeping the skins on. There's a lot of nutrition in the skin. I'm going to throw these in here. And there's also, we're mixing this with um, cauliflower. So we're not getting all of just the starch of the potatoes. We're lightening the load of this mix with some of the cauliflower. We're using frozen florets today, but you can go ahead and cut up and break off florets from fresh cauliflower, whatever you got. And I'm just going to say, do top down here. Oh, we do, we, turns out we do have a sponsor today, guys. That is great. An additional sponsor, too. We've got Alignment Health as a sponsor today, and we just want to thank them for joining us because they understand that eating healthy is an important part of staying healthy, and we don't always think of our diet as the biggest piece, but it is. It's so important. Good food is good medicine, so want to thank them for supporting this healthy lifestyle so all of us could be together today. So I'm just cutting these guys in about one inch rounds. Potatoes are never the same size. That's not a thing. Mother Nature does not work that way. So the most important thing, what do we think the most important thing when cutting these potatoes are? Throw them in the chat. I want to see it. You guys are very smart. I know you'll know this, but it's always good to go over. What do we got? Marie. First one, didn't even have to look that up on Google, just went with it. Yes, Marie, same size. When we are do making food like this, we want to go the same size, the same for sauteing vegetables together for soup, roasting vegetables for a side that you're putting on a sheet tray. You, it doesn't, if you don't really understand exactly what's in the instructions, like a certain, like an eighth of a quarter inch or something like that, the biggest thing you always need to remember is just have it the same size because then everything finishes cooking at the same time, and that's what we want. We're using these little cute fingerling guys. I also really like Yukon Gold or um, Russets. Pota mm, potatoes with the skin. I'm a big skin girl. I love eating potatoes with the skin on, especially like a baked potato. Love that skin. I think that skin has so much flavor, and it gets really crispy. Um, if we want to go ahead, Chef George, let... Viola from the American Diabetes Association, and she's going to talk a little bit about the nutritional content of potatoes and cauliflower here as I'm cutting these potatoes. Yeah, so as you mentioned, the skin on the potatoes is really great. I mean, that's where you get the fiber. The skin is a good source of fiber. Also in potatoes, they're an excellent source of potassium and vitamin C. And, you know, it's great because potatoes are a fat-free food. It's just how you cook them that really, you know, makes a difference here. And you're and excited about this method, potatoes with cauliflower. And cauliflower really is an excellent yeah. source of all kinds of vitamins and minerals. You know, it contains almost every vitamin and mineral that your body needs in a small amount. Um, and, you know, you can just enjoy it in many different ways. So they're both, they make a great combination together nutritionally. Yeah, as well as taste, right? <laughs> that's fantastic. I mean, I love cauliflower, but hearing that it's got a lot of all the nutrients that you need, that makes me feel very happy about eating it. So thank you, Viola. Guys, she's on the chat. If you have questions, throw it in there. She, I can't begin to describe how much smarter she is than everyone. So she's got all the questions. Do you know how smart you have to be to be a nutritionist? So throw those questions in there because it's such a special occasion to be able to have someone with all her resources on the chat. So thank you, Viola. Appreciate it. Um, 
So I've got, I think my favorite line from that is potato is a fat-free food. That made me very, I don't know why I had such a positive reaction to that. I think because it always feels so indulgent. So if you see here, I got my potatoes cut up, similar sizes, cold water. I have a little stove off to the side here. Pardon my reach. I'm just going get, to get this guy over and start it. And we're just going to start cooking. Bring it to simmer. Bring it to, I mean, a roiling boil. We're going to cook these for 15 minutes. We've got our cauliflower here. Again, we're using frozen florets. What could be easier than that? But you can also use um, fresh cauliflower if you've got it. Again, same size. If you're cutting it up, the goal is to make it the same size. So 15 minutes. Cauliflower, it doesn't cook as um, long as the potatoes. So we're going to add those in in the last five minutes of cooking. If you're using fresh, closer to about 10 minutes of cooking. And then we've got some delicious things to add in there. My, my mouth is already watering, guys. It's already, I love, or I'm, I'm that mashed potato person at a restaurant. I get very excited. There's a restaurant in San Francisco. I'm from California. I just recently moved here called the House of Prime Rib. It, it's pretty straightforward. It's literally a, a place that just serves prime rib. But I go there because of the potatoes. I love it. That's how much I love potatoes. I, I can't get enough of potatoes. So got those guys going. OK, getting onto our steak over here. I've just got my um, stove on low. We're using strip steak today. This is my strip steak. Trimmed the little fat on the sides here to trim it down. I just want to get it as lean as I can. I've got it over here. Beautiful piece of meat. It's from the short loin on a cow. So it actually doesn't get a lot of work. When you're thinking about the more expensive or the more quality pieces of meat, the ones that don't get a lot of work are the more tender ones because they're not very muscly. They don't have a lot of connective tissue. So strip steak is great. Also known as <laughs> multiple names. Anytime you look up beef, it's like they're on the lamb. They have all these different aliases <laughs> and other names. Strip steak is also known as New York steak. The reason for that is, is that it was, um, there was a restaurant in New York that's known for serving. Their special of the house was the strip. So then it just got known as New York steak. Does anyone, I know this is a hard one, but we got people from all over the country. Does anyone know what that restaurant's called in New York? Let's see. For that, that's why it's called New York strip. This is a really hard one. I fully understand if you got to Google. Let's see. I'm not seeing it. Oh, all right. Delmonico's, you guys, that was, that was a pool, snaps, that was a pool, All right, that, well, sir, well done, yeah, Delmonico's Steakhouse, it's been there since like the 1800s, and so that's what they're known, so that's why this strip steak, you might know it by different names, and the one other thing too is to, based on what region you are in the country, sometimes it might have those other names, but lean, tender, that's perfect what we're looking for, so we've got our steak here, I'm just gonna season kosher salt, fresh ground pepper. So the thing to know about when we're cooking healthy is that we wanna use high quality ingredients. We wanna use quality flavor. I am a big proponent of fresh ground pepper. Can't say it enough, fresh ground pepper. I just feel like there's a huge flavor difference between pre-ground and fresh ground. If you do pre-ground, great. You do what you got, okay? No shame here. But I just want to bring you in on the flavor explosion that is fresh ground pepper, okay? We're not drenching this in salt. We're just getting our seasoning over here. It's just getting a nice crust on it. Got that on it? Both sides. Leave no one behind fresh ground pepper. I love that smell when you do those first shakes of fresh ground pepper. So got that going. We have our steaks here. So now I've got my cast iron. I'm going to turn it on. We're going to higher heat. We're going to start at high heat, kind of get that crust going, and then we're going to turn it down. Get it up here. So cast iron, when I'm searing steaks, 
I'm all about the cast iron. All about the cast iron. It's really um, holds heat really well. And I feel like what can really kind of hit you um, when cooking steak, cooking any kind of protein, is having sudden drops of temperature. So cast iron with its thickness will really, if you kind of give it a little preheat, will hold it really well, will hold that heat, and that allows your meat, your protein, to cook really evenly and also get a really nice crust on it. Because cast iron is so thick, sometimes if I'm doing a lot of steaks, if you maybe say do a double, triple of this recipe, big party, I would throw, I like throwing my cast iron in maybe like 375 degree oven for about 20 minutes to preheat it. And then I put it on my burner. That depends on what burner you do. I have a gas burner, I, so I just put it on that. You might need to be a little more de delicate with an induction. But because doing that, it really makes sure it holds my heat even more. So I'm just bringing this up. I've got that heat. Chef George, could you send me over that um, thermometer? Yes. So I'm just adding a little olive oil in here. You can use vegetable oil if you want. Get that heat. It's worth waiting for. Worth waiting for. Going to go a little higher and put these guys in. Ooh. Can you hear that? I'm getting my mic close. Can you hear the little little heat there all right oh that's what you want to hear i instantly the aroma that goes off of that there's something so primal with steak <laughs> just hits off you get that really good savory flavor so i said kosher salt we have a question about pink salt there can be like pink himalayan there's different salts out there for cooking, most chefs that I know, and we're just gonna do a couple of minutes here, cooking, and then I'm gonna flip it over and turn down the heat. Use kosher salt, that's the main one that we use. Um, it doesn't have any additives to it. It's got to me uh, just the perfect feel in my hands. Uh, when you're going to grab it, you just got an instinctual feel about it. Um, you have table salt, that's fine. Know that there might be an additive in there. Pink salts, Himalayan salts, uh, volcanic salts, these are really meant more for finishing. So that means when these steaks are done and I've sliced them up, that's the time maybe you use a finishing salt. If you've got bruschetta that you're serving, you've got a big pile of tomatoes all over it, that's the time maybe you use a finishing salt. For this, I like just going straight kosher salt here. You guys do you, do what makes you happy. So got these going. Mmm, I can't, the smell in here right now. I'm so, so happy. It's got just that caramelization of the meat when it hits the pan. Perfect. We're going to do these with some smothered onions. What that really means is that we're just going to top it, smother the top of this with some onions. So we got to get going on our onions here. I'm going to just start slicing as our steak's cooking. Let's give a little peek here can see. You see how it's starting to get across there? It's okay to move it around. I know a lot of people maybe say don't move it around a ton. I've read stuff. I've done all the deep dive research. Turns out in the end it doesn't really matter. So if someone's giving you a flack for flipping it too many times, uh, it actually can cook more evenly if you do that. So stand your ground, okay? But I'm going to leave it. Mm. Just a little, little perfume on the sides there. All right, these guys are going... Sliced onions. We're going to slice up some onions here. It's always good. I mean, we're just going back to knife skills now. We're using, uh, you can just use sweet onions, yellow onions, also a huge fan of here. If you're not an onion fan, if you can do shallots, I think shallots would be just as good in here. Really, really nice. I know a lot of people aren't necessarily onion fans. I love onions. I can't get enough of them. But if it's really a deal breaker for you, maybe try some portobello mushrooms thinly sliced. Mushrooms and steak go really, really well together. Peppers and steak go really well together. So bell peppers thinly sliced, fantastic in here as well. Got my onion. It's always good. It's always good just to get a basic first week of culinary school reminder of how we cut an onion. So do a little top down here. 
you always want to make sure that you half your onion this way, that each half has a piece of the core, because the core is going to hold our onion together as we're slicing. So I always slice off the top, and then top down here, let me show you guys. Cut it in half this way. That's what we want. And now we have a flat onion that isn't going to roll anywhere. And that's what we want for knife safety. If your onion rolls, you could roll your knife right into your finger. And then I'm just going to take off the sides here. Who gets, I get, I don't know if it's just me being really sensitive to it or, I mean, I've worked in kitchens for 20 years. You would hope you'd get a callus to it, but my eyes, I still have not figured out. I, it's going to water. That's why I, I already sliced half this onion so I wouldn't start crying in front of you people. I mean, I have to face some fa save some face here, guys. Um, I've heard some tricks if your eyes water a ton when cutting onions. Putting on your overhead vent, it supposedly helps because when you slice open your onion, what you're releasing is gas. So by turning your vent on, it kind of sucks up the gas. I also hear that the gas is attracted to moisture. And your eyes are the first thing that have moisture that comes in contact with. So that's why it's kind of going to your eyes and making you react. So putting a wet kitchen towel around your board can help. I was teaching a cooking class, and I had a gentleman tell me that he used to work at an In-N-Out, and what they did there was take all the leftover pickle juice and put it around their onion boards when they were slicing all the onions. I mean, I trusted this guy. He seemed to know what he, he at least spoke confidently about it. I don't know if that's a myth or if that's true, but you do you. In the end, there are onion goggles that is a thing they sell. I thought my glasses would help, but all it does is trap the gas on my eyes when it gets up there. So a lot of times I'll take my glasses off when I'm doing this. I mean, the problems of being a chef, you know, guys? We're using two onions here. You might think, ooh, two onions, that, that's a lot. But we're going to cook these down in the residual fat, that flavor that's in this pan. So as the onions have a ton of water in them, so as we cook them, that moisture is going to evaporate off and are, they are going to shrink. Any French onion soup lovers out there? I'm a, oh, I love French onion soup. So French onion soup is really that kind of beef, that savory beef flavor and onions. So I almost feel like this is kind of giving us that vibe of French onion soup, these smothered onions. We're gonna cook these down. They're gonna be so nice. Again, this is the kind of techniques of really kind of caramelizing your onions a little bit with a little bit of herbs, some flavor, and that leftover pan juices that make me, this like triggers, you know, fine dining flavors. So you can get, I mean, we're doing a really good mindful cooking here, but this is the least thing from bland to me. Like onions sauteed in beef juice, that, that's a party, guys. Should we check our steaks? Let's do a little, let's see where we're at. Oh, look at that. I mean, come on. Now I'm gonna turn down just to medium, give these a couple more minutes. All right. Pretty good, right? I could honestly just be happy with that. This is kind of a party here. Oh, that, that color and that caramelization there, it's, it's just giving, it's all the fills. It's really just giving all the fills. So we have our sliced onions here. We're gonna go and do a little bit of thyme. You can do dry thyme, you can do fresh thyme. Here's our little difference here. We got our dry thyme here. We've got our fresh thyme here. Up to you. I actually think dry thyme is one of those things, one of those seasonings that does really well, really well mimicking kind of the fresh. I feel like dry thyme has a ton of flavor. Um, just checking on my potatoes over here. Everyone looks like they're having a party. I'm gonna give them a little stir. So don't have any shame with dry thyme. Try it herbs. Do what, do what you got, right? We're all busy. Use what you got. I don't know what the oldest spice you have found in your house is, but I have found in someone's house, a friend's house, 
will not be named, but this is recently, and it was from the 90s. So think about that. So check your spices. Everyone, you're like, do I have spices from the 90s? You might. You might, you might have bought that, like, pumpkin pie spice and used it once, and it's just back there. Um, spices, I mean, they can last past their expiration date, but really what you're trying to look here is for potency. The longer they are dried spices, the older they are, you lose that potency. So we're kind of wanting to do mindful, healthy cooking here. Flavor is important because that way we don't want to reach for fat. We don't want to reach for sugar. So we want to make sure we're using the brightest flavors. So is, it's the, a good idea once a year, go through your spices. If it has a 19 instead of a 2 in front of it, Thank it, thank it for its service and send it on its way. <laughs> Put it in the compost. I don't, a lot of people find older spices in their parents' home. I don't know what the oldest one of you found, but my, I'm not even parent, friends, 1990s. I didn't even ask, I just threw it out. I said, I'm throwing this out. Like, okay, there's more, no shame. It happens to all of us. Let's see, going over here. There's also a lot of great Almost done there. Want to get a little more crust. There's great salt-free spices out on the market. That's sort of something really good to be aware of because they add, add, they tend to have really great flavor combinations, but you're not getting all that sodium. So, so that's something really important to think of when you're doing mindful cooking is making sure that you're not uh, adding too much sodium in there when you're buying pre-mixed spice blends. There's some really, I think people are more aware of it, so there's plenty of ones out there that you can find. Just at the regular grocery store, it's not something you have to special order. I'm gonna go a little on my side here too. So, does anyone know? Before I ask another question, let me check in. Chef George, how are we doing? Do we have any questions out there? I think we're doing pretty good. Quite, quite a group today. Are you just glad you made it through the week? It's Thursday. We're just glad to be here, right? Yeah, I hear you guys. Or are we just glad we made it through January? Is that kind of the mindset right now? <laughs> made it through the first month of 2023? I hear you guys. I'm right there with you. So give me a little crust on these guys. Mm -mm -mm. So I'm going to, um, one thing I forgot to mention at the top that I'm going to tell you now that I did with these steaks that I think is one of my most favorite important steps to tell you when cooking protein, but especially beef. I patted these guys dried with a paper towel before cooking. It makes such a huge difference. Getting rid of that, that moisture that's on the surface of your meat is a barrier to your meat getting brown. So that moisture has to steam away before you can start getting that really nice dark brown. This brown, I mean, look at this color right here. Look how beautiful that is. That's all flavor. We want flavor. Again, these are the techniques where we don't have to reach for more fat if we just know these that helps during cooking to make sure we get our maximum flavor. Pat, you wouldn't think it, but patting your meat dry before searing, before roasting, ooh, gives you a really, really nice flavor. The other thing too is at the beginning of class, we salt and peppered our steaks. You can do that half an hour, an hour before. Keep it in the fridge. You can even do the day before and keep it in the fridge. The longer it sits on your meat, it kind of migrates and makes it way and flavors the whole meat. So again, by doing that before and letting it kind of soak in and marinate, that's going to prevent you from oversalting your meat and using too much sodium because you're giving it time to really get in there. Not crazy steps, right, but kind of just little things. So salting before and letting it sit at least like half an hour and patting it dry, important steps. So let's get, oh, getting such good color, guys. This is just making me so happy. So I've heard a lot of chefs talk about all the different ways how you tell when steak's done or what just protein in general. There's a thing going out there about knuckles. Some people use that one. I have little hobbit paws here. They're not, I, they're different than a giant chef's hand that's working in on the line, all right? It's not the most foolproof one. I'm a food scientist. I'm a, I'm a linear thinker, I'm straightforward. Food thermometer, food thermometer. This is the easiest way. You, uh, this feels like so much more work than using this. Find, your, find you a good instant read thermometer. I'm just gonna stick it in the middle here in a thick part. 
What are we cooking today, guys? Medium? Are we medium rare, people? I actually think this is perfect. This is right where I want it. You know, rare, you go somewhere between, you know, 130s and 140s. I'm going here, taking this out, just letting it sit, turning down my heat a little. It's totally fine. I will not shame you. This is a safe space, at least with me. I don't know about everyone else in the chat. There's a lot of people here today. I will not judge you if you say you are a well done steak person. To each their own, okay? Just know that a food thermometer, if you do have a hard time, it's hard trying to get it exactly in that bracket from rare to medium rare to well done to really well done. It can go quick. So food thermometer can't, can't rave about it enough. So look at this guy. I'm more of a medium person. I, I, I'll admit it, medium well. I'll say it. I, I like a little more on the well side. I'm going to say it unashamed. That's who I am, okay? So see all this beautifulness in here? There's a name for this. Throw it, throw it in. Me, I saw medium well. Excellent. Lena, I'm right there with you. Thank you for not letting the cheese stand out here alone. I'm at medium well as well. This stuff has a name. Let's see it. Do we know? Fine. Look at you guys. Yes, stuff. Yes, lizard. Yes, Giovanni. Yes, fond. I'm still waiting for the day when someone makes a shirt that says, I'm fond of fond. I will wear it. I haven't found the guy to make it yet, but I, that's my dream one day is to have a shirt that says, I'm fond of fond. This is all the flavor. That's what fond is, all the flavor. So we're now going to add a remaining little bit of olive oil here. We're only using in this recipe, um, we've got only here, guys, a... Uh, like a tablespoon, a little over a tablespoon. So it's not a lot of fat, not a lot of oil. This moisture from these thinly sliced onions that we have, that's gonna kind of deglaze our pan for us. That's gonna release the fond. So as I'm cooking, as you can see here, got just down on medium heat now. These onions are gonna start to wilt, gonna start to simmer down. We're going to do this for about five minutes here. Just cook. Already you can see here. Do you see that color? These onions are picking up all the flavor, releasing it from the bottom of our pan. So we've got, ah, oh, this is beautiful. Already starting to sizzle. You could throw a little garlic in here if you wanted. Nothing wrong with a little garlic. Again, you also want to kick up with some of those sodium-free seasonings. Go for it. We, but I think we got enough. I'm really liking the flavor of thyme in this. Anytime I cook onions, sauteed, grill, roast, I always use thyme. I feel like thyme and onions are kind of a classic pairing. They really complement each other well. And you can see all this dark. That is the fawn being released. So the moisture in the onions is picking everyone up off the bottom of the pan and just letting it come with it. You can see we have pretty even slicing here on these onions. Again, same size. If you guys wanted to do a dice or a chop, go for it. I kind of like the idea of that really thin slice though. This is making me really happy. So we just got these guys here. So we're gonna add our thyme. We also have some water to help release the additional amount of that fond there. Got a little bit of brown sugar. I mean, when I say a little bit, a little bit, that's half a teaspoon. That's just meant to add that kind of little caramely note that you normally get from like caramelized onions. If you're not comfortable using it, if you're really, really wanting to watch your sugar and you're like, I've over sugared the day, I don't want to add that, you do not have to add that. There's so much flavor in this onions, you'll be fine. If you want to substitute it with um, a sugar substitute, brown sugar, there are some of those out there. You can do that as well. And just a second, everyone, as I simmer these along, got these going. Let me check my potatoes over here. 
Smells fantastic, everyone. You can see this. Simmer, simmer, simmer. Checking my potatoes, guys. All right. We're having some little power flashing over here, so we just have some crew going to check on it. Mmm. Again, peppers, mushrooms, if onions aren't your thing, okay? Totally fine. So I'm just going to go ahead. I'm going to add the little brown sugar in here. Nothing wrong with that. Add my dry thyme in here. And then water. And we're going to cook these for 10, between 10 and 15 minutes. So nothing wrong with that. Get these going here. There we go. I'm just going to cover these. Let them cook down. I really wish you could smell this. The second I added that thyme in, I just got this intense hit. Go around. Okay. You know, you could do this on this meal on a grill too. The end of January, or practically summer, you guys. <laughs> so you could do this on a grill too. Cast irons work great on a grill. They do really, really nicely on a grill. So I'm gonna take these guys over here. Let's go back and check on our potatoes, shall we? My steak's doing fine over here. It's got a lot of juice in it. Don't you dare throw out that juice, that juice's flavor. We can pour that in with our, on top of our onions as we're slicing. Keep all the juice. That's why cutting boards have that rivet around the side. Really good. Keep this over here. I'm just gonna do a little switcheroo with my potatoes. Get these guys going. So our potatoes have just been hanging out. They've been coming to a boil. They've been doing really nicely over here. You want them fork tender. That is our goal, is fork tender potatoes. So get these guys up. Oh yeah, those guys look really nice. Getting the boil going on over here. I like, this is, I like that the onions, onions and the steak are one pot. I'm doing these potatoes in another. So we're getting these guys going. I'm gonna add my cauliflower in. Let me just kind of check to see the texture. Get one of these guys. Yeah, they're almost there. So we'll add our cauliflower in about five minutes. I mean, I love these pre-frozen florets. Nothing is better than this. Again, use whatever tricks you can to make it easy during the middle of the week. Because weekends sometimes can be even busier with sports and everything going on. We, you, there's no shame in using frozen veggies. I use frozen veggies and frozen fruit all the time. In fact, sometimes you get better quality with those. The reason being is that, I'm just going to use my little lid over here. The reason is being is when manufacturers freeze fruit or veggies, they are picking the ultimate prime time when they're at their full sweetness, when they're at their best flavor, the most ripe, perfect ripeness. So you have sometimes better quality or more consistent quality in frozen veggies than you would maybe sometimes depending where you live in the country. I mean, it's January right now, so sometimes it might be hard finding good produce. Nothing wrong with frozen. I use frozen all the time. Love this, adding these guys in. My favorite story. I I'm a lifelong Californian, so I've always lived in where all the food's grown. Um, my company had people visiting from Minnesota, and they were staying for a month. And this was in January. All we heard, they were going to all the different grocery stores in Berkeley because they were so excited about the produce that was available. They couldn't believe the stuff that was available during January. So I guess we take, Californians don't take it for granted. Not everyone has all the fresh, beautiful berries and greens right now. So that's why I say no shame, no shame in using, 
using the Frozen. Frozen's great. I never knew. I mean, I grew up in the Central Valley where the food is literally on the side of the road, guys. I mean, it was a learning experience. Got that going there. All right. So we got our steaks rusting. You could tint them with a little foil. I will say the smothered onions are warm, so they're going to add some warmth back to our meat. I'm not really worried about that. If you really tightly cover your meat when you take it off to rest, you could actually keep the cooking continue. It's always going to continue to cook, you know, between three to five degrees. But if you were almost there and you really tightly seal it, you could take it to where you pulled it from your favorite perfect temperature and take it over. So just kind of be mindful of that. Of don't really too tightly do that. Got our onions, got our potatoes going. What else we've got here? We got a little skim milk. Perfect. We can, again, we can still have milk. This is great. We, we still get delicious things. I can't. Mashed potatoes, mashed cauliflower, you got to have a little milk in there. We're just using skim milk. We've got um, here some, let me get down the top down so you can see it. We've got here some Smart Balance Margarine. You can use your favorite brand of margarine or plant-based, like, quote unquote, butter spread, but just know the nutrition facts. If you are getting this off the website, that's the one that it was planned for. And we've got some salt and pepper. If you want to add some additional flavor to this mash, any type of fresh or dried herb. Ch I love like starchy mash with chives in it. Love it. Can't get enough. Love adding chives or green onions over here. Can't get enough of it. Um, if you're in the summer, if you're making this meal in the summer, fresh basil would also, I know maybe you might not necessarily think potatoes and basil, perfect. Really nice combination. Can't get enough of that. Um, again, any of those sodium-free seasonings you want to add. You can roast a little garlic and, and slice a bulb, the top off a bulb, put it in some foil, throw it into the oven for about 45 minutes, maybe like a 350 degree oven. Just don't be mindful. Don't put a bunch of fat on it. It will steam and be okay without the fat. You can squeeze the bulb. It just, it comes out like a paste. You can squeeze the bulb over in your potatoes. That's a winner. Using, using roasted garlic bulb and mashed potatoes. That's, a, that's one of my favorites. Chef George, how are we doing over there? Everyone's so quiet today. We got any questions? Yes, could you use evaporated milk instead of skim milk? Evaporated milk? Well, hmm. Well, if you want to jump in, I'm not sure. It depends on, I mean, you can. The, the thing you just need to know is each type of different um, type of milk you ha use will have a different nutritional content. So skim milk, we're using skim milk because it has the lowest amount of fat. So I'm not sure comparatively how evaporated does with comparatively to skim, but you, I mean, you can absolutely use it if you got it, it will work. Might be a little sweeter though. Evaporated milk definitely I think has a sh higher sugar content because it's concentrated. And that's something we really kind of want to make sure we're careful and mindful of. But good, good question. Interesting question. And one more milk question. Yeah, could please. Use, uh, could you use oat milk? Oat milk? Of course. Plant milk. I use plant milks in uh, mashed potatoes all the time. The thing, again, you just have to compare next to the, start, um, the nutrition facts. So I don't know right off the top of my head how, um, oh yeah, these are, these are feeling good. I don't know off the top of my head how oat milk compares nutritionally to skim milk when we're talking about amount of fat and calories, but I've definitely used oat milks. I've used almond milks in um, my mashed potatoes before. It works out delicious, really nice. It's got those guys and check the chat. If anyone, if you, Viola, if you have that comparison or know that, can, you guys check the chat we'll throw stuff in there if we've got it so we've got these going i think just another minute and we'll add these guys in slice up our steaks and we'll be ready to go are you getting hungry it smells really good in here as we it's got major steakhouse vibes in here guys again if you're liking these recipes if you're connecting to this recipe today and saying like this is great i never would have thought of doing this stuff the diabetesfoodhub.org They've got all your recipes, dreams, 
ready to come true, I'm going to take a little fill trip with my mash over here, okay? Going on a little fill trip. I'm going to just turn this off, and I'm going to drain this, okay? So walk over here. We're going to drain up our mash. We have our cauliflower. We have our potatoes. Don't toss the pot, okay? We want the pot. The hot pot is going to dry these out a little bit. So before you add your milk in, before you add your margarine in, and this is any time, any type of potatoes that I make, I'm always giving it a minute in here because we want to dry it out. So just give it a minute to dry it out. We have the skins for the nutritional content on our potatoes. So normally, I highly recommend for mashed potatoes or even with mashed cauliflower, using something called a ricer. It's a little press that you can put your potatoes in and press and it comes out in little grains. It's also how I make my gnocchi. It makes it really fluffy and incorporates air in there and it's really nice to use. A larger version of a ricer is a food mill. Has anyone got one of those lying around? It's kind of old school, but it goes, it's how people used to make parades and mashes in the day. It's very satisfying to use, you guys. So I've got this in here. Okay. So I've got my temp on. I'm now going to add my skim milk. Let me do a little top down for you. Again, we have a little freshly ground pepper, salt, any type of herbs you want to add in here, you can absolutely add. And then I've got my margarine in here. Add that in. You can feel free to turn it on just to help melt that milk and butter. Honestly, I could kind of just eat it like this. <laughs> this looks really good. It smells really good. Getting, getting that milk evaporated out a little bit. Mm -mm -mm. This is today. Marks our 12th let me say that again, one, two, our 12th class that we have done from the ADA. We are so lucky. This has been such a fun partnership. We have explored so many fun recipes. We've done pot pie. That was actually one of my favorites. I think that might've been my first ADA class that I did. We've got so many great recipes. 12, flew by, they're so much fun. I think this is by far, with that 4,500, this is the largest showing we've gotten in a class. So cheer, cheers to you guys. Thanks for joining us. All right, we see that coming down. I'm just going to start mash. Look at this fun little masher. So I'm going to use a masher. Like I said, normally I use a press. Something that you need, and I... I kind of like the rustic fills of this. We've got steak, we've got those onions. I'm not wanting to get that too fine, diny, like smooth, smooth puree. I think this is perfect, especially with those skins in there. I kind of like the little, I'm a texture in my potatoes. Throw it in the chat. Are you the smooth one or are you the texture person? I know that can be a polarizing, I know that has broken up holidays, family holidays, because we can't agree on the texture of potatoes. But myself, I am, ooh, I like a little texture. I, li I like not on something. And the, the cauliflower just kind of mashes up beautifully in here. It's really nice. Smooth and around. Good workout, guys. So the recipe says after this, you can also take a little immersion blender. You can maybe pop it quickly in a Vitamix just to give it a little puree, get that little smoothness. But I'm going to keep it chunky today because I really like this texture. It's, I, I'm really feeling it. You do you. What I would not advise doing it is in a stand mixer with a paddle attachment. The reason for that is, is there's so much starch in potatoes that once you release that too much of the starch, and that's what the paddle does, you get a pasty potato. Do you know what I mean by that? Have we all experienced the shoe paste potato that, that just like sticky and glue? Yeah, it happens. I've still eaten it. I mean, it takes a lot more than that, guys. It's potatoes, but like it can, it's not the most enjoyable favorite potato experience. So something to think of for that, that you just want to um, not 
be gentle with it. This is a hand. Going to, forceful with this mashing's fine. But paddle or food processor, you're, you're, you're going to shoe pace land. Just and, saying. And it looks like Debbie has a question. Yeah, Debbie. Yes. Hi there. Hi, Deb. How's it going? It's good. I haven't seen you in a little while. I know. Nice to see your face. It's nice to see you. Guys, I have to say... It's sad because Debbie had the most hol beautiful holiday decorations up, and now that I don't see them, it's just reminding me that the holidays are over. I know it's sad out here, isn't it? I mean, I don't. Maybe you some, wait ten months. Some giant heart Sorry. cutouts, if you could, for Valentine's. Ooh. I mean, I don't know. What, what are you? I'm going after it. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to let you know, Ar had a question. He was very serious about a question, and Ooh. so. He would like to chat with you. And I just had to, I oh had to say hi. Oh my gosh, yes, and AR. Just to let you know. Yes, all right, all right. I'll see you, see you later. Thanks, Deb. Deb, Deb, Lena, I've got, Steph, I've got my people, Michael, who are just keeping things running. You know what I mean? They're keeping the trains on time. Thank you, Debbie. AR, AR if you want to put your hand up, if we can find you, or Chef George, if we can find your, okay. My, I guys, I didn't know if you were coming, coming to the gun show today, but this is what's happening right now. We're really working it right now. This looks hey there, delicious. Hi, buddy. How's it going? Well, the thing is this. <clears throat> My question was so long ago. It was pertinent at the time. It's really, it's really, really not. Oh, buddy. I'm sorry. We're losing you a little bit. If you can put it in the chat, add it into the chat. By the way, if I if I don't if it's not within five minutes, my brain forgets it as well. So you're in good company there. <laughs> no shame in that. Time and moment. What I was going to ask is uh, earlier when you made. Oh, yeah, I, my uh, my connection just froze a little bit. Yeah. So oh. sad, isn't that sad? I, it is. I'm <laughs> sorry. All right. You know what? If you can think of it, put it put it in the uh, chat. Put it in the I chat. Did put it in the, I put it in the chat earlier. The question had to do with additives to the meat, etc. Do you ever use baking soda? And and if you do use baking soda, for what what um, different types of cooking tips do you use baking soda? Softening beans when it's when you're when you have beans and you want to cook them tomorrow, do you use it to on meats to tenderize it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's actually a great question. I'm gonna start slicing steak, everyone. Yeah. Um, and I'll answer your question. Thank you, Ari. That's a great question. And also what you want to do is try to find the grain, try to find the lines, and go try to go opposite of it. That way you'll get a really nice tender bite, okay? Oh, that's great for me. I like that. Um, I can do a little top down here. Everyone's going to have opinion that this is either overcooked or undercooked. This is perfect for me right here. I'm cutting it nice and thin. We just want to remind you that for um, this recipe to meet the nutritional content, the requirement for um, the 88, we are going with a smaller portion of two ounces, maybe one when I say smaller, smaller than what maybe you're compared to in a steakhouse. But I want to say that protein's amazing and delicious, but it doesn't have to be your whole plate. We've got this beautiful mash over here. We've got all these onions. So you're still getting a bunch of savoriness, but this is just portion control here. Look, I mean, that's perfect for me. So baking soda, yeah, baking soda is... is kitchen witchcraft it's really it's got that acid it works magic on different ph's so you can use it to your advantage to get things really brown or to tender nice tender not tenderize Ooh, good thing we're at the end guys it's the the chip is starting to malfunction <laughs> tenderize um i personally don't use it to brown meat um but i know people who can you can add it to a big one is to speed along caramelizing onions. But I feel like I still, humble brag, I'm a super taster. So um, I actually, but I have a really big sensitivity to bitter and metallic. So sometimes if I use, I've tasted onions with the baking soda in there, it feels a little metallic to me. 
So I don't, but that's kind of what I was mentioning um, with that. So I am just gonna take a beautiful serving. Again, you can puree more if you want, but honestly, I really like, I am super happy with that beautiful mash. I like mash with texture. Oh, the steak is making me so happy. Look at this beautiful clean hands. We're just going around here. Why does it always feel so s fancy having steak? I don't know why, but I always kind of feel like I'm in a four-star restaurant. We do I have a food science question. Oh, um, hey -o. By adding milk or butter before you mash or process them, will that prevent them from getting gummy? Um, one more time. If you add milk or butter... Before you process them or mash them, will that prevent them from getting gummy? Before you process or mash them? No. No, you won't. I mean, I'll make it delicious. I'll, I mean, fat, milk and butter always make things delicious, but that's not going to do it. It's the starch in the potatoes is the starch in the potatoes. And anytime you kind of manually work those potatoes, whether the milk and butter are there before or after, it's going to release it and make it starchy. I like where your head's at. Whoever asked, that's a good question. But no, we, we um, there's no kind of trick around not getting that glue out, that glueiness out. Look at these. Uh, can we just take a moment for these onions? Do you see how dark and caramelized those got? Okay, it's smothered. So we're going to smother these. Get a nice caramely flavor over the steak. Oh, guys. Come on. Look at that. Beautiful. Got our mash, got our steak. I do this for you. I'm going to taste it. I mean, it's hard work, but you got to do it. Get a little piece of the steak and the onion. Actually, I want a lot of those onions. Those onions look really good. And some of that mash. Let's do it. Okay, that's a big bite. You're going to have to give me a minute. Um, um. Oh my god, it's so good. <laughs> mm. There's so much texture. There's so many different flavors. I'm getting that kind of buttery creaminess from the mash. The steak, because we got that crust on there, is so savory. It's really, that's what's hitting me first is, ooh, really like just deep savoriness. And I'm finishing with those really subtle, the wonderful sweetness of those onions. It's not artificial sugar sweetness. It's just all those beautiful natural sugars in those onions were brought out. Oh, ooh. I might have to have another one for you guys. That was really good. Oh, my gosh. We did it. A little power snap and everything. And we still did it. Well done, everyone. Look at, look at Lena's, everyone. Look at that. Oh, well done, Lena. That's beautiful. Oh my gosh. Everyone, I want to thank you for coming today. This is one of our biggest classes we've ever had. It's you are the the juice that makes this machine run. You are our favorite people in the whole world. And every day we have class, it just makes us so happy. So thank you for showing up. New friends, we hope to see you again. Returning friends, homemaders, you know we love you. So thank you so much for being here. Can we just take a moment? Big snap, up, snap ups to Viola and Molly because they are doing the work. Let them hear it. They are doing really hard work. Not all heroes wear capes. They are making sure that the world is healthy and happy and giving us all the tools we need. Yes, thank you guys so much. Thank you so much to the ADA. Thank you so much to Alignment Health for partnering with the ADA and sponsoring this class. Look more into them on their website and all their support and help. Um, Tag us on social again and uh, look on our website, homemadecooking.com, if you want to see more classes coming up. We've got on 2 1 broccoli, beef, and ginger noodles. I wrote that recipe, it's a good one. And then on 2 7, we are doing avocado Alfredo and crispy chicken. Ooh, let me say that again avocado Alfredo and crispy chicken. I'll be, I think I'm teaching that one too. I'm just hawking myself now. This is embarrassing, guys. That's going to be a good class, so we hope you sign up. And um, most of all, most importantly, diabetesfoodhub.org. Okay, one more time, diabetesfoodhub.org for all your recipe needs. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Until next time.
keep on cooking. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.